What if the solution to water shortages could be found in the form of a morning fog, providing drinkable, irrigatable water? Imagine, if you will, you're a farmer trying to grow crop in the Sahara. Quite the difficult place for agriculture. Or maybe you're trying to grow crop in the Sonoran Desert. One day, your source of water, an oasis, begins drying up. Your only realistic option is to dig a deeper well, right? Mm, not really. I mean, yeah, it is an option, but it's not the only one. Even arid deserts have plenty of moisture in the air. I'm talking about coastal fog. These fog events are most common in the early morning and tend to dissipate quickly as the sun rises and heats the air, at which point you've lost an opportunity. But what if you could capture this morning fog and convert it into irrigation for your crops? Or hell, maybe even drinking water. Some cultures have been doing this for centuries using water sieves or fog nets, but they're wildly inefficient. You know, uh, worst case scenario, they convert about 2% of the fog into water, and best case scenario, only 10. And that's where high voltage physics might just change the game entirely. Over the past month, I've worked to build and optimize a watering system unlike any other, converting the elusive moisture in fog into pure water within seconds. This video is sponsored by Groons, and stay tuned to the end for a huge announcement. If this sounds sci-fi, well, it almost is. Except it's not. You see, I'm not the only one to consider using high voltage to condense water out of fog. A recent study by MIT in 2018 explored this very thing, and their results were biblical. Using an ion emitter, they introduced a 10 kilovolt charge to the incoming fog droplets and directed them towards a grounded collector grid. They tested with and without power, which clearly indicated the application of high voltage to a fog net can increase water collection by 20 times. In fact, there's a time-lapse video of the experiment they posted on YouTube. It's easy to understand what's happening here. I'll link the study and the video down below. Now, they used a 5 by 5 centimeter grid about the size of this box for their experiment, but it doesn't necessarily prove the feasibility of this on a larger scale for agriculture. I want to radically upscale this process, test various geometries, and see if this tech could change arid agriculture going forward. In extreme environments like the Sahara or Sonoran Desert, water is incredibly scarce. That's why plants, animals, and even people need to find creative ways to stay hydrated and nourished. While I'm building a contraption to extract water from the air, another way to stay on top of your health, especially if you're not always getting the perfect diet, is with Groon's gummies. You know, I've been really health-oriented most of my adult life. So when Groon's reached out to sponsor this video, I was really curious. Within each daily snack pack are eight gummies which together nourish your body with 20 plus vitamins and minerals and 60 plus whole food ingredients plus prebiotics. Groons contains 100% of your daily needs for safe vitamins and 25% of your daily needs for certain minerals that are known to be potentially toxic at excessive levels. And to cover their bases, the gummies are vegan, nut-free, gluten-free, and dairy-free. Which is nice because eh, I'm severely lactose intolerant. Additionally, they did something a bit unique to stand out from the other supplements. Groons is methylated, which is fancy talk for our vitamins like B12 and folate can be absorbed by your body easily. And folate is required to build new DNA. Fun fact that I didn't know until recently. 30 to 40% of people have an MTFHR gene mutation, which can make the buildup of non-methylated vitamins toxic. With Groons being methylated, all people can benefit. Methylated equals vitamins are ready for all bodies to absorb, so Groons gummies actually work for everybody. Honestly, I'd be lying if I said they weren't delicious. <laughs> Click the link in the description down below or scan the QR code on screen to get up to 45% off your order of Groons today. Okay, back to the science of pulling water out of thin air. Besides this MIT study, there's not much literature available on this topic. I mean, asking ChatGPT if high voltage could be used to collect fog? The only thing it referenced, the only thing it could find on the entire internet besides the study, was a video of mine from a few months ago. Yeah, I'm kind of in unknown territory, but that's kind of my favorite place to be. If I'd be producing water, this meant I needed a container to capture it. So I got to work building a simple acrylic tray long enough to house a two-foot section of equipment. After a bit of boiled bean water and some thinking, I designed a setup that would do the trick. Two separate pieces, one side emits fog and electrically charges it, and the other side is grounded metal mesh to condense the fog. This was an easy print for my Prusa, and I was off to a hot start.
If you haven't used glute before, it's amazing. It chemically bonds your PLA pieces together, helping you to create really massive 3D prints. Right, with the system set up, let's talk power. I designed it to run off 20 to 30,000 volts DC. The flyback transformer I built for a recent video was a perfect candidate, but if you'll recall, it produces 65 kilovolts AC, which is too much. So I tuned it down to a family-friendly 8,000 volts and then ran it through a voltage multiplier, giving it approximately 35,000 volts DC. Negative connection goes to the metal grid and positive 35,000 volts goes to the emitter side. To simulate the morning fog needed for tests, an ultrasonic fog maker volunteered as tribute. Dry ice, Hell yeah. I'm breaking up with you. Righto, I've got the entire setup here, the fog production, the condensation, and the high voltage power. Now I'm gonna run two tests. The, uh, the first test will be running the fog through the system without power to see just how much of that fog condenses on the mesh, uh, the, the mesh grid. And then the second test will be running fog through it, but then applying power. And the, uh, any differences between those two tests should be from a single change in variable. Test one using only fog and no power. Admittedly, this is an unrealistically dense fog. Regardless, I let the system run for five minutes and then checked for liquid water. From the looks of it, absolutely no water condensed on the grids. This is still, this is still bone dry. Nothing condensed. A bit of a shocker. I expected a little bit of condensation, but I have no water to measure. Without power, the fog does not condense. But with the addition of power, that all changes. You'll notice the fog immediately accelerates towards the screen. It's amazing going the whole lengthwise. All the fog is completely attracted to the grounded mesh. <laughs> yeah, it's working. That is working. Within about 20 to 30 seconds, the entire metal screen was drenched in water. Look at that, you can see all the water droplets building up. <laughs> this is working so well. After about a minute, the water formed into droplets which fell increasingly faster, and after about five minutes, a clear puddle was visible. It was really remarkable to see. This process took place along the entire length of the screen, but was strongest near the ends. This is working so much better than I could have hoped. Woo! Let's collect the rest of the water. All right, so I squeegeed all the water to one side of the box and power was on for about five minutes, so that gives us a time component. Now to measure how much water was produced. <laughs> 40 milliliters in five minutes. 40 milliliters with just the first prototype. I'm like, this is a lot more than I anticipated. And I have some ideas on how to improve the process. Luckily, this entire high voltage electrode with all the plastic and metal in it can be simplified into just a wire. A bare thin wire charged to a high enough voltage will easily ionize the surrounding air. Do you, do you see the wire? <laughs> Probably not. And a thin wire can be stretched over a length of crop weighing virtually nothing. That's attractive. Additionally, the power source can be scaled down significantly. Currently, it's overkill. The general idea was that I design the entire system in on shape and create two garden stakes. One stake contains the high voltage power source and the other is simply an anchor. I bounced back and forth deciding on the geometry and layout and after a few shapes I settled on these babies. The one on the right is the powered stake, the left, the anchor. I'll leave a link down below to try out on shape for free. Next, the building began. That'll do.
after a few more days and some iterations I didn't show on camera because there were a lot of changes, this is the final result. You've got the multiplier up top, driving circuitry down below, rechargeable battery right here with uh, electrical ground here, and positive 20,000 volts out the top. It really took a lot of work to get this all in the package that you see here, which is essentially a stake that I stab into the ground. As I mentioned, there's two stakes that are inserted into the ground, a powered one and an unpowered one. These get connected by a rod and some wire. Time to test if this is a really good idea, a crazy idea, or maybe I'm just crazy. If I'm gonna try and duplicate a desert situation, I need a box that can hold the sand, the apparatus, the fog, the whole deal, and this isn't gonna cut it. But this guy, <sighs> I think that'll do the trick. After a quick trip to Desert Depot, I found myself staring at an assortment of spiky little cucumbers, also known as Satan's houseplants. These are designed for arid deserts, so I grabbed two of them and 100 pounds of rough sand. Here's the setup in its entirety, quick to assemble and rigid. A double length of wire is stretched across the top and the mesh is grounded. We've got the desert, we've got the fog condenser. Now we're just missing the fog and the power. Once the desert was all fogged up, I powered up the system and was really blown away. Oh, that's remarkable. Just immediate. The fog immediately clears out. Yeah, I can see water condensing all down the length of the condenser. You've got your water droplets right here. It works and it works well. Um, in terms of actual water production, I don't know the numbers at this time, but there's a very clear line of wet sand underneath of it. The entire length of the way underneath the condenser, it's pretty much soaked. All right, here's a better view. You can basically see the whole line of irrigation. It's, it's really something. I mean, it, it works. It takes about 30 seconds to set up, and then within minutes, you have enough water to drench a line in the sand. And last I checked, crops are grown in lines. Now, as for the science behind this all, it's brilliantly simple. The wire is positively charged to 20 kilovolts DC by the circuit I built. When water droplets within the fog come into contact with the wire, it steals electrons from the water droplets, making them positively charged. Since the grounded metal grid is only centimeters away, the positive water droplets are attracted to the metal grid and fly towards it. More and more droplets stick to the grid, creating an accumulation of pure water. Now, all logical science aside, it wasn't a really huge shocker for me that this condenser would work. And let me tell you why. So when I was first designing and testing my BSI Mark II ionic thruster, I kept having issues that I didn't fully understand. As it sucked in increasing amounts of fog, water would start to accumulate on the grounded metal rods to the point that it would drip and short out the thruster. You can see some of the water droplets right here. Oh, it honestly was annoying as all hell and it contributed to a whole redesign of the thruster, but it did teach me that fog will condense if it's attracted to a grounded metal object. Thus, the fog condenser, an energy efficient way to harvest water. And let's talk energy. The condenser is powered by an 850 milliamp 12 volt battery and pulls 39 watts of power continuously. After I ran the system again and collected water, it produced 45 milliliters of water in five minutes. Oh yeah. That means it creates just under 14 milliliters per watt hour of energy. Or in simpler terms, a two foot section of this setup produces 540 milliliters of water per hour using only 39 watts. Knowing that, I was curious, how do these stakes compare to a commercial dehumidifier? Um, this one was cheap, but 4.5 stars, so clearly it works. 
By stupid chance, it also runs off 12 volts and consumes 40 watts of power, just like the stakes. When turned on and given the same density of fog then ran for 5 minutes, it produced a staggering 5 milliliters of water. Wow. That's only 60 milliliters per hour at a rate of only 1.5 milliliters per watt hour. The stakes are eight times more efficient at producing water than a commercial dehumidifier, and they use low enough power, they could be powered by solar. But best of all, this is entirely scalable. With MIT's study testing the science and my larger scale experiments testing the scalability, I really think this tech could be expanded further to be used for arid desert agriculture. In coastal regions of even the driest deserts, morning fog can be really dense. It represents a temporary water source that's gone as soon as the sun comes up. But hopefully soon that won't be the case. I want to refine this further into a larger system and then test it out in the Atacama Desert in Chile. I think I said that right, Atacama Desert. Anyways, it experiences really thick coastal fog, which will be perfect for testing this on the larger scale. Let me know your thoughts about all of this in the comments down below. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.